at the end of the coronation, after they have received Holy Communion at the High Altar, the King and Queen will return again to their thrones, and an anthem called the Te Deum, short for Te Deum Laudamus, We Praise Thee, O God, will be sung in English to a setting composed by William Walton. This anthem, as its opening words suggest, is a hymn of praise to God for all that he has done, and it has been sung at the end of the coronation ceremony since the Middle Ages. During the Te Deum, the King and Queen will again make their way towards the High Altar, and they will disappear through two doors on either side of what is termed the Altar Screen. As they pass through those doors, they enter one of the most intimate and sacred places in Westminster Abbey, and we won't see it on our television screens. The space is called the Chapel of St Edward the Confessor. Here the King will take off his royal robe, the stole, the super tunica, and St Edward's crown. He does that in this particular space, as it's always been done here since the Middle Ages. The reason the chapel is used for this at the end of the coronation is because the crown and the robes were relics, holy relics associated with St Edward the Confessor, and they had to remain in the abbey. The centrepiece of this small chapel is the shrine, the saintly tomb of St Edward the Confessor, who was the second to last Anglo-Saxon king. He refounded Westminster Abbey as a monastery and as his royal mausoleum. The present shrine of the Confessor was constructed by King Henry III and completed in 1163. Although relics and the veneration of saints were abolished by Henry VIII in the 1530s and 1540s and the shrine was in his reign demolished, Edward's body, his relics, were removed from the shrine and reburied under the ground. The pieces of the shrine were also preserved. And then, in the reign of Mary Tudor, when Catholicism was restored, they were replaced and the saint's body was once more placed in the newly reconstructed shrine. There his relics have remained ever since, contained from the reign of King James II in an iron-bound chest within the shrine. In front of the shrine is an altar dedicated to St Edward, and when he enters this space, King Charles will take off St Edward's crown and he will lay it upon that altar. No doubt this brief moment will give the king some respite and time for reflection after what will have been a gruelling coronation ceremony for him. Now I've been in St Edward the Confessor's Chapel some years ago now. It is an extraordinary space. The abbey is vast but this place is very intimate Not only is it a place where you can feel the years of spiritual devotion, but also the immense weight of history. A history that stretches back, like the coronation ceremony itself, for a thousand years. As King Charles III stands in there and removes his royal robes, he will be surrounded by the tombs of many other English kings, his forebears, who have, like him, been hallowed and crowned in the spot in the Sacrarium before the high altar of the Abbey. On the north side of the chapel is the tomb of the man who built the present Westminster Abbey and also constructed the Confessor's Shrine, King Henry III. He also commissioned the great Cosmati pavement on which the King has just been crowned. Henry had a strong devotion to his predecessor, St Edward, and he was originally buried in the former grave of the saintly Saxon king in the earth. His present tomb was constructed by his son, King Edward I, and was decorated by the same Cosmati craftsmen that worked on both the pavement and the shrine of St Edward. Next to Henry III is the tomb of King Edward I, the Hammer of the Scots, the person who brought to England the Stone of Schoon and commissioned the coronation chair that Charles has just been crowned in. Then on the other side, opposite Henry III, is the tomb of his great-grandson, King Edward III, one of the greatest and longest reigning of English kings. He brought great stability to England as well as war to France. 
To the east of him is the tomb of his grandson, one of the most disastrous medieval kings, King Richard II, a boy king full of promise who ended up being deposed in 1399. Then at the east end of the chapel is the raised chantry over the tomb of King Henry V, the victor of Agincourt, who brought to the English crown the crown of France. So as the king retires to this extraordinary space, he is surrounded by a mixed bunch of his forebears, some saintly, some devout, others great warriors, others great administrators and politicians some with despotic tendencies, some with ideas of grandeur. Some are for best to emulate, many are not. While in the chapel, the king will change into his purple robe of estate, the one worn by his grandfather, King George VI, the great man of courage and service. He will place on his head the imperial state crown, worn both by his grandfather and his beloved mother, our late lamented Queen of Happy Memory, Elizabeth II. In the front of the crown is the Black Prince's ruby, which is another link to this long history of which our king is now a part. A spinel that by tradition was worn by Henry V at Agincourt and by Richard III on Bosworth Field. On the top of this crown is a cross with a sapphire in the centre, a sapphire that was once in a ring that was worn on the finger of Charles's great saintly predecessor St Edward, who lies only feet from him. It would be a very insensitive person who didn't feel the weight and continuity of that history, and our new king is a sensitive man. He will, in this moment, feel the weight of responsibility upon his shoulders keenly. The king emerges from the devotional gloom of the inner sanctum that is St Edward the Confessor's Chapel into the bright light of public glare and as the choirs begin to sing the national anthem he then prepares to process from the place where his forebears rest down the length of the nave of Westminster Abbey to the waiting crowds the latest in a long line of kings who have been hallowed, anointed and crowned within this great church. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy my videos and would like to support my channel, there are a number of ways you can do that. At the top of the page I have links to PayPal. I'm also enabled for super thanks. There's a little thank you button at the bottom of each video where you can make a donation to the channel if you've enjoyed it. I also offer channel membership, which gives you access to member-only content. And of course, I publish my monthly magazine, The Antiquary. There are links to that uh, in the comments box below. All support is most gratefully received and it helps me to carry on bringing you further content. Thanks very much indeed for all of your support.